Hey guys. Yeah. Yes. You know how I'm like going to college soon? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm going for like information thing. So like computers, coding, all that stuff. And a thought, a thought occurred to me. I am literally becoming a real life wizard. In a sense, I guess. <laughs> Anyways. Hello and welcome to Traveler's Tips and Tales. My name is Ben. I'm Jake. And I'm Mike. And today we're talking about wizards, the coders of D&D, the guys who sit <laughs> down and fiddle with spells until they either A, explode, B, fizzle, or D, do the thing they're supposed to do. They skip yes. the C. Wizard. Why I'm not going to lie. Not gonna lie. Just between me and the listeners here, they're my favorite spellcasters. Still yet to play one, though, in, like, a <laughs> recurring game. Yeah, you played one in a one-shot. I played one in a couple of one-shots. <laughs> one on the podcast, even. Well, I, really I need to play them. more of them, not gonna lie. I play a really mean wizard, but I just don't play them very often. You don't yeah. play it all very often. <laughs> <laughs> Got him. I'm gonna go cry in a corner now. <laughs> all right, guys, all right, so guys. Now I'm running this episode. <laughs> Starting off with wizards with our key abilities. <laughs> Intelligence. That's the oh, most important one. Dude, I never saw it coming. You have to be a super nerd. You have to be a super nerd because all of your spells involve around intelligence. The number of spells you can memorize at a time involves around your intelligence. Uh, yeah, it's just spellcasting modifiers. So, you know, yeah, your DC, your mm -hmm. spell attack modifier, True. all that. The other stuff. one, other one that's super important: Constitution, because you are weak. Yeah. The weakest of the links. <laughs> Yeah. If there was a weak link in any party, health-wise, it's the wizard. Unless that party also has Cade. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, see, because of wizards being so weak and only having a D6 hit die, um, that is why in the one-shot I'm running starting next week, possibly for the next couple weeks, I don't know how long it's going to take, so I don't know how many episodes it's going to be, but wizards get a little bit of advantage if they roll for health. They get to re-roll ones and twos because I feel bad for them. <laughs> As you should. At least uh, at low levels. Until they get to high levels. High level wizards are terrifying forces of oh, mind-altering, reality-warping, magical prowess that can mollywop entire parties with a single spell. Who needs spell slots? Or, or, sorry, who needs hit points? Well, and who needs spell slots? <laughs> yeah, depending on the wizard, the wizard, you know. The wizard needs spell slots, I'm not uh, To an extent. High-level I mean, wizards don't need them as not much. As, not anyway. as much as, like, a warlock, I guess, but... <laughs> anyway. The wizard is the classic, you know, the big hat, flowy robe, show-off-y, wizarding, like, magic boy. They have a spell book that has all their spells in it. That's what makes them different from all the other spellcasters. And here's the crappy thing about that. They are capable of losing their spell book and thus losing all of their spells. You hate to see it. <laughs> that's why a lot of wizards have backups. <laughs> uh, that's a really expensive uh, backup, I'm not going to lie. It's expensive, but it's more expensive to lose it and not have one. <laughs> Yeah. So, some yeah. unique features about the wizard now that we've gotten that disclaimer out of the way. First up, Arcane Recovery. Starting at first level, this is the thing you get right off the bat, and you get Arcane Recovery. And you have learned to regain some of your magical energy by studying your spellbook. Once per day, when you finish a short rest, you can choose expended spell slots to recover. The spell slots um, can have a combined level that is equal to or less than a half your wizard level. Round it up. And none of the spell slots can be 6th level or higher. For example, if you're a 4th level wizard, you can cover up to two, level, uh, 2 levels worth of spell slots. That could be either 2 1st levels or 1 2nd level spell slot. But yeah, it's pretty neat. Nice. You can uh, get a couple of spell slots back even though it's just a short rest. Get a little juice back. You it's know. always useful. That's what I like about sorcerers, their ability to expend sorcery points in order to regain spell slots. Yeah. It's kind of like uh, the wizard version of that, I guess. Except better. <laughs> <laughs> I 
because they're not losing out on other abilities because of it. Yeah. But yeah, that's Arcane Recovery. Yeah, the uh, the next unique feature that you get, you know, you've you've leveled up a couple times and you found yourself at you know level eighteen, oh, where you okay. get your when second unique class okay. feature. Cool, 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 cool. cool. Called Spell Mastery. You have achieved such mastery over certain spells that you can cast them at will. Choose a first level wizard spell and a second level wizard spell that are in your spell book. You can cast those spells at their lowest level without expending a spell slot when you have them prepared. If you want to cast either spell at a higher level, you must expend a spell slot as normal. And by ex- by spending 8 hours in study, you can exchange one or both of the spells you chose for different spells at the same levels. Nice. That's pretty nice. Yeah. So all of my favorite spells are like third level and lower. So that's pretty awesome. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, dude. If only it was third level, you could just always be able to cast counter spell. Like, or oh, fireball. That'd be so cool. Well, wow. you know what's even better than that? What? But also kind of not. 20th level signature spells. So you know that thing you just got? Mm hmm. Well, now you get to learn two third level spells that you Ooh. always have prepared that you can cast once per day for free. <gasps> nice. Counter Only spell, once per day. here I come. <laughs> hey, I that still is... get one free counter spell. That's worth it for me. Well, there you go. Or Fireball, or Lightning Bolt, or any other third level spell. Yep. But counter spell. <laughs> or counter. We also kind of, uh, kind of brushed over this thing because technically it's just a part of the um, spellcasting, like ability, like where it breaks down, you know, like how you figure out how many spell slots you have, how many prepared spells you have, yada yada yada, whatever, whatever. Um, but also a cool thing that wizards can do is that they innately just have ritual casting, so they can cast ritual spells without exceeding the spell slot or without expending a spell slot. And they can just do it. Yeah. <laughs> it just takes ten extra minutes. It is pretty chill. <laughs> it's pretty neat. Pretty Which is kind of chill. a thing that pretty sure all the other spellcasters don't really just have. Unless they're like like druid and cleric, I feel like. I think those ones have it, technically, but yeah. But yeah. But anyways. <laughs> Next up. Uh, the only thing that really differentiates one wizard from another, aside from what spells they choose, is their subclass. And a wizard subclass is a little different than every other class. Every other class, you get some kind of niche, you get some kind of thing that gave you your power or that you focus on that makes you really, really unique. With wizard, it's generally just a branch of magic. They're all the same, but a little different. Mm Mm-hmm. There's one for each school of magic, as well as a few others that specialize in different things, such as war magic or blade singing, things like that. And we're going to go down the list. (laughs) But first and foremost, before we start, the most important thing to know is no matter what, if you choose, with the exception of, I think, war magic or blade singing, if you choose one of these uh, archetypes, you will get whatever spell school the spells you chose are, the class you chose, you can learn those spells in your spellbook, just copying them in for half the time and half the amount of money you spent on it. Yeah, for like on so, paper and stuff. Just because you are you're you know the spells pretty well, you kind of got a head start on the other wizards, yeah. you know. It's yeah. like your special, like, area that you, you studied more of, you know. Yeah. It's like, if you're a coder and you're like, man, I really know this one kind of code. And then someone's like, well, can you copy this? And they're like, man, I know that. I know that. That's the thing I do. <laughs> I get it. Yeah, I can connect the dots halfway dude, through. Dude, I'm like, like oh, fluent in HTML, dude. Don't even worry about it. Like... <laughs> but yeah. <laughs> First up, though, is one of my favorite subclasses. It's called Abjuration. And Abjuration focuses on magic that blocks, banishes, protects. It is a thing that sets up magical wards, such as Arcane Lock. It sets up um, shields on people. The spell shield physically is an abjuration spell. Yeah, and protective it, things. Yeah, it's all protective and warding, and it's all meant to protect you and your party from whatever might come near you. I'm pretty sure Counterspell is also an abjuration spell. 
It might be. Pretty sure. At second level, when you take it, you get an ability called Arcane Ward, which is one of my favorite abilities that wizards get. Yeah. Uh, you can weave magic around yourself for protection. When you case when you cast an abjuration spell, a first level or higher <coughs> shield. It's a fifth level spell. Um, you can simultaneously use a strand of the spell's magic to create a magical ward on yourself that lasts until you finish a long rest. The ward has hit points equal to your to twice your wizard level plus your intelligence modifier. Whenever you take damage, the ward takes the damage instead. If this damage reduces the ward to zero hit points, you take any remaining damage. Uh, age armor, also a first level spell. Uh, yep. Increases your AC yep. for eight hours. for eight hours. Uh, uh, uh. <laughs> While the ward has zero hit points, it can absorb damage, but its magic remains. Whenever you cast an abjuration spell at first level higher, the ward re regains a number of hit points equal to twice the level of the spell. Thus, the higher the spell, the better it is. So the first time you cast it, uh, let's say mage armor, you get the same bonus as any other abjuration spell. And after that point, every time you cast shield, which increases your armor by even more, <laughs> yep. you get 10 more temporary hit points on top of that. Well, it's depending. Great. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Once you create the ward, you can't create it again until you finish the long rest. So, yep. you know. But, cool. I mean, it, it lasts forever. Pretty cool. Pretty cool. You also get, at 6th level, projected ward. Starting at 6th level, when a creature you can see within 30 feet of you takes damage, you can use your reaction to cause your arcane ward to absorb that damage. If this damage reduces the ward to zero hit points, the warded creature takes any remaining damage. You can just say no. Okay, Zarya. <laughs> from Overwatch. Okay. The, <laughs> the, the, the fighter in front of you gets hit from behind. You're just like, mm, no. <laughs> You're just like, bubble. <laughs> Stay yep. safe, my friend. At 10th level, you get improved abjuration. As if you needed it to be. You... When you cast an abjuration spell that requires you to make an ability check as part of the casting of that spell, as in counter spell and dispel magic specifically, you can add your proficiency bonus to that ability check. Nice. Oh yeah. And at 14th level, you have advantage on saving throws against spells. Furthermore, you have resistance against the damage of spells. Period. Nice. You know how balls amazing that is? <laughs> <laughs> Must protect... Just... Must little protect self. Flesh. <laughs> yes. Little flesh being that has big brain. Very Can delicate. Do, that is amazing. You're just like, <laughs> nah, you can have advantage on every saving throw against every kind of spell imaginable. Also, if you do manage to hit me with a spell past my ward, I have resistance to it. Yeah. Pretty, I don't even care. It doesn't bother me. Pretty bonkers, honestly. It's pretty amazing. Plus, just the fact that like your ward thing is based off of the level of spell you cast, so at higher levels it'll get better because you're casting bigger spells. Yep. Also, pretty bonkers. Yeah, the, the half that levels with your spells, and then there's the other half that levels with you. So no matter yeah, what, it's always exactly. going to stay amazing. Exactly. If, if the listeners can't tell, I also really like Abjuration <laughs> Wizards. <laughs> They're pretty awesome. But, oh, yeah. yeah. But yeah, I'm pretty sure that's it for abjuration here. So that would be move it. Move on, mosey on over to a school of magic that I think is kind of cool, and that is conjuration. And as a conjuration wizard, just like conjuration magic in general, is like you summoning things out of thin air. So like you, you know, you summon creatures, or you summon objects, or whatever. You're just making something out of nothing, kind of a thing. Um, so you also get the thing where like. All your spells cost half as much time and money, yada, yada, yada. But also, starting at second level, when you take this subclass of being a Conjuration Wizard, you get to, uh, when you select a school, you can use your action to conjure up an inanimate object in your hand or on the ground in an unoccupied space that you can see within 10 feet of you. The object can be no, longer, no larger than 3 feet on a side and weigh no more than 10 pounds. And its form must be that of a non-magical object that you have seen. The object is visibly magical, radiating dim light out to five feet. The object disappears after one hour when you use this feature again, or if it takes any damage, or if it deals any damage. So, you know, you could summon, like, a weapon and then use it once. <laughs> or, or, more importantly, you, know, you can summon a key to a door you've seen before. True. Or, more importantly than that even, you can summon up a badge of office. You can, you can summon up anything. 
you can summon up pretty much anything as long as it's like not too big and it doesn't weigh a whole lot. You could like summon up like documents as, as long as you've like seen them. That's pretty interesting. And yeah. also, like, as a wizard, you could probably, like, you know, maybe take the keen mind feat where you remember everything in the last month. You know, that might help you out in that, in that you know, realm of area, you know. So, anyways, uh, at 6th level, you get another ability called uh, Benign Transposition. Uh, starting at 6th level, you can use your action to teleport up to 30 feet. Uh, to an unoccupied space that you can see. Alternatively, you can choose a space within range that is occupied by a small or medium creature. If that creature is willing, you both teleport, swapping places. Once you use this feature, you can't use it again until you finish a long rest, or you cast a conjuration spell at first level. It's really useful as a wizard to just, like, plop yourself out of any trouble that you might be in and put some big tank boy there instead, you know? Mm-hmm. You can imagine and the fact they managed to sneak resets. around the back. And like yeah, they're and... ambushing the wizard, and it's just like, oh, you thought I was the wizard? No, I'm the barbarian. <laughs> <laughs> Who's already raging? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, and it's just like the fact that it resets, and you can use it again whenever you use a conjuration spell, which you probably have a good amount of them in your wheelhouse because you're a conjuration wizard. It's pretty awesome. Anyways, uh, starting at tenth level, you get uh, an ability called Focus Concentration. When you are concentrating on a conjuration spell, your concentration cannot be broken as a result of taking damage. That is awesome. Especially for a conjuration wizard, because you can just summon a bunch of things, like creatures, have them be fighting for you, and then if someone whacks you real hard, they won't disappear, and you lose out on your really cool thing that you were doing all combat. You know? Which is important. Yeah. Next ability you get at uh, 14th level is called Durable Summons. Uh, any creature you summon or creature or, or create with a conjuration spell has 30 extra temporary hit points, which is kind of poggers, because sometimes stat blocks can be a little squishy because you're kind of limited on like, you know, the like CR that you can summon them with, and you like compared to you or any of your teammates, they're kind of lower on the HP front. But yours, yours are a little bit more bulk, which can always be helpful. Just think of it like putting a wall between you and the enemy, and that wall is made of hit points, and it also attacks back. Exactly. And any wall that is between me and the enemy as a wizard is a good wall. Necrotic <laughs> works the same way, fun fact. <laughs> yeah. But anyways. That is Conjuration Wizards. Yeah, so that brings us over to a neat little one called Divination. Uh, the divination. Game-breaking one. <laughs> Listen, man, <laughs> it's not that game-breaking. <laughs> it's okay, okay. it's just neat. How about how about we just start reading some abilities here, Mike? Yeah, yeah. So if you are Let's a divination up. wizard, a diviner, um, then you kind of manipulate the veils of time and space and consciousness to be able to see things in a different way. And if you are having trouble imagining that, then think of, like, a psychic or an oracle. Um, that mm -hmm. is some common examples of they someone can, like, who would be divination. They can not so much as control time or anything like that, but, like, yeah. see into the future. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. so... Or, 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 you know, see what your big bad is doing all the time, because <laughs> why not? You know, we already know it's him. Might as well just spy on him constantly. Let him, let him, let him read the the, the thing. Sorry, I'm just salty about it still to this day. So at second level, you get an ability <laughs> called Portent. Uh, when you choose this school, glimpses of the future begin to press in on your awareness. When you finish a long rest, roll two d20s and record the numbers that you rolled. You can replace any attack roll, saving throw, or ability check made by you or a creature that you can see with one of these foretelling rolls. You must choose to do so before the roll, and you can replace a roll in this way only once per turn. Each foretelling roll can be used only once. When you finish a long rest, you lose any unused rolls. <coughs> so, hey, yeah. Hey, do you want the lucky feet, but for free? Uh, I mean, it, it's a little bit different, because you have to use it before the roll. Yeah, but, like, it's kind of a lucky feat, but for free. But, I mean, 
at the same time, if you roll your two rolls for the day and one of them or even both of them happen to be natural 20s, you can just choose to succeed whatever you want. Or if they're natural also, ones, then you can just choose for somebody to fail an attack or a spell roll against you, no matter what. <laughs> can it, can can you be the only one that can like take those rolls? Can you make someone else's roll be that roll? Yeah, so it's any it's you or any creature that you can see. Or oh you can do what I did in that one shot a while back, and you can choose to use a pretty good number to guarantee a hit when you have disadvantage. Yeah. Exactly. Or be like, hey, Paladin, you want to smite? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Or just say, hey, you know Rogue, what? you want sneak attack? <laughs> yeah. Or you know someone has to succeed on that charm spell, because otherwise they'll mm. smite your entire party. So you're like, yeah. you know what? You get a 19. <laughs> <laughs> Plus your modifier. <laughs> yeah. Ooh, minus three. Yikes. <laughs> At sixth level, you get an ability called Expert Divination. Casting divination spells comes so easily to you that it expends only a fraction of your spellcasting efforts. When you cast a divination spell of second level or higher using a spell slot, you regain one expended spell slot. The slot you regain must be of a level lower than the spell you cast and cannot be higher than fifth level. Okay. <laughs> Broken! <laughs> hey, uh, I really need a uh, third level spell slot so I can I can cast things like, uh, I don't know, counter spell or fireball. So <laughs> let me just expend like a fourth level or higher spell that I don't really need. And honestly, I could afford to use this spell because it's useful right now anyway. So yeah. We just do that and get a third level spell slot. Because why not? It's just like, why though? <laughs> you could just you could just use Mage Armor and then get the spell back when you cast a spell later anyway. Yeah. Like, well, uh... <laughs> You're basically... I mean, not quite doubling up, but for lack of brain power right now you're doubling up on your spell slots <laughs> yeah. for fifth level and lower uh-huh uh 10th uh, level you get an ability called the third eye you can use your action to increase your powers of perception when you do so choose one of the following benefits which lasts until you are incapacitated or you take a short and long rest you cannot use the feature again until you finish a rest uh you can choose between dark vision gaining dark vision out to 60 feet Ethereal Sight, seeing into the ethereal plane within 60 feet. Greater Comprehension, being able to read any language. Or See Invisibility, seeing invisible creatures and objects within 10 feet of you that are within line of sight. Yeah, you're just a scion now. Broken! At 14th level, <laughs> you get an ability <laughs> called Greater Portent. The visions in your dreams intensify and paint a more accurate picture in your mind of what is to come. You now roll 3d20s for Portent rather than 2. So yeah, you just get even more rolls to do whatever you want with throughout the day. Oh, by the way, disclaimer. Yep. Uh, DMs, if you don't plan ahead for your campaign, if your player's like, I think I want to play Divination Wizard, tell them no. <laughs> because they'll be like, I want to scry, and you'll be like, you see nothing. W why? Because there's nothing to see. Because <laughs> I, I haven't, haven't thought of it. it. <laughs> yeah. I think I did that even earlier today. I was like, here's the list. The list may update later. <laughs> like, I even yeah. put that on there. I was like, I might change this. <laughs> I might mm -hmm. add more, because I just don't know yet. <laughs> but imagine that, but like, all the time. Because your divination <laughs> wizard's like, I'm gonna scry! Like, stop! No! <laughs> Stop scrying, for the love of God. <laughs> if you don't have world development, you'll get world development. No players will force you, dude. Yeah, it's no pretty joke. great. <laughs> it's horrible. Please. <laughs> Please stop. So what you're saying is you want a full party of divination wizards. What I'm saying is if you do that, I'll throw a whole horde of barbarians at you. With spell immunity. Alright, so that's divination. <laughs> <laughs> to enchantment. Oh boy, enchantment. 
So, uh, I gotta be real with you guys. I actually, I've never really looked at enchantment, but now that I have, I kind of want to play an enchantment wizard at some point. It's pretty lit. So, first of all, enchantment. What even is enchantment? Why, like, is that like making items magic? No, no, it's not, unfortunately. It's confusing, but it's not that. Enchantment is mind control basically charming and beguiling monsters and creatures to serve your own will and needs basically you're like uh you're you're a weirdo basically you're you're a mind controlling weirdo that's like everyone will do what i say because i said so and i find that kind of uncomfortable not gonna lie <laughs> there are people like that and i don't like those people <laughs> so if they if they had magic i'd be even more uncomfortable with it but at second level, you get Hypnotic Gaze. Uh, so your soft words and enchanting gaze can magically enthrall another creature. As an action, choose one creature you can see within five feet of you. The target can can see or hear you. Either one. It must succeed on a wisdom saving throw against your wizard spell save DC or be charmed by you until the end of your next turn. The charmed creature's speed drops to zero and the creature is incapacitated and visibly dazed. Nice. All right. That's an, <laughs> not gonna lie, that's pretty amazing because an incapacitated creature, if it gets hit with a melee attack, it's an automatic crit. Uh, <laughs> on subsequent turns, you can use your action to maintain this effect, extending its duration until the end of your next turn. However, the effect ends if you move more than five feet away from the creature, if the creature can either see nor hear you, or if the creature takes damage. Once the effect ends, or if the creature succeeds on, on its initial saving throw against this effect, you can't use this feature on that creature again until you finish a long rest. But hey, you get that free crit off, right? <laughs> yeah. Dude, imagine sneaking up on the wizard, whacking them. They turn around and you're just like, oh my god, they're beautiful. And then you're just incapacitated until they decide to, like, not. <laughs> and then the paladin just walks over and he's like, hey. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, basically. I heard it's you not... like radiant damage. <laughs> <laughs> and of course you being charmed are like, I love radiant damage. Oh god! <laughs> oh god! Oh Jesus! <laughs> it's oh, not no. what I wanted at all! <laughs> <laughs> at 6th level, you get instinctive charm. When a creature you can see within 30 feet of you makes an attack roll against you, you can use your reaction to divert the attack, provided that another creature is within the attack's range. The attacker must make a wisdom saving throw against your wizard spell save DC. On a failed save, the attacker must target the creature that is closest to it, not including you or itself. If multiple creatures are closest, the attacker chooses which one to target. On a successful save, you can't use this feature on the attacker again until you finish a long rest. You must choose to use this feature before knowing whether the attack hits or misses. Creatures that can't be charmed are immune to this effect. It's still amazing, though. That means the guy that tried to hit you didn't even hit you. Yeah, he hit the pretty great. <laughs> valuable for you, as a yeah, invaluable. At level ten, split enchantment. When you cast an enchantment spell, a first level or higher that targets only one creature, you can have it target a second creature. Ooh, that's amazing. That one, that one's pretty good. You know what's a specific spell I think I would use that on, all mm. the time? Crown of Madness. Hmm. Mm. Make two creatures fight to the death for your amusement. How about, Just walking how down about, the street. How about haste? Ooh. Oh, mm -hmm. actually, that's, that's amazing. That's where my brain went. <laughs> how about haste? How about Dude. slow? Oh. How about oh. sleep? Hmm? Hmm? Sleep, sleep already oh, targeted. Uh, it doesn't target people. one creature. You're right. Never mind. But, but haste. But haste. Oh, my God. Haste. Mm. Haste, slow the paladin slow. and the fighter. <laughs> <laughs> and at 14 this is where this this subclass gets a little creepy for me a little bit more than normal you know oh, alter okay. memories at 14th level you gain the ability to make a creature unaware of your magical influence on it when you cast an enchantment spell to charm one or more creatures you can alter one creature's understanding so that it remains unaware of being charmed additionally once before the spell expires, you can use your action to try and make the chosen creature forget some of the time it's spent charm. The creature must succeed on an intelligent saving throw against your wizard spell save DC or lose a number of hours 
of its memories equal to one plus your charisma modifier, minimum of one, you can make the creature forget less time, and the amount of time can't exceed the duration of your enchantment spell. You know, you roofie them. Right before <laughs> you read this ability, I was about to go. You know, this is like the most charisma e wizard I've ever seen. You roofie now them. it's like fully just like based off your charisma modifier. <laughs> like, uh-huh. like they're yeah. just straightforward with it. Like, hey, I. This sounds like it might be entertaining to play, you know, fun to play, but it also sounds creepy. Yeah, it's <laughs> kind of weird. It's like, if I had one of these guys try to... It's a little unsettling. It's like, did you charm me? No. How do I know you didn't charm me? What did you do? Like, I don't know, like, man. Like, I, like, I wouldn't really want to RP this. I wouldn't either. <laughs> but also, like two haste at the same time. <laughs> yeah. See, that's when you just multi-class out of wizard before you hit 14th level. <laughs> yeah. You just hit 10 and you're like, that's good enough for me. Yeah, now I haste myself because I'm going to go into fighter. Like, <laughs> or paladins. That way you can smite the force of yeah, the gods. After you, after you make them incapacitated. Oh my goodness. Yep. Oh my god. <laughs> But yeah, uh, subclass uh, for wizards. This one, it's creepy to me. I don't like it. I like I like it from like a player standpoint. I don't like it as like a person. <laughs> yeah, you know what I'm saying. Like I, if I an enchantment wizard point. tried to join my adventuring party, I might be like, ooh, ooh. why are you an enchantment wizard? First, <laughs> what kind of person are you? Like, I get that the sc- the spells that you study are, like, really cool, but also, like, ooh, some of those things you do, ooh. It's like, listen, if you want to be charming, just be a bard, please. Like, why aren't you a sorcerer? Like... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. This poor guy, anyways... it wasn't bored one. <laughs> <laughs> you I can't play an instrument. I'm just a nerd. Please let me in. Nope, you <laughs> can't do it. Sorry, bro. You're gonna have to charm your way into some friends. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna. <laughs> and then they do it is the problem. <laughs> yeah. Yikes. Like, with no problem at all. It's like, yeah. It's like okay. Welcome like three, board, maybe. a few hours later, you're just like, man, have I been with this guy all day? What happened? <laughs> yeah. Anyways, though. Anyways. They're not the only wizards out there. True. In fact, the next style of wizard is one that I really like. And that would be evocation. Gasp. Evocation what? is about creating powerful elemental effects, such as a searing flame or a crackle of lightning, and using that power to do some serious damage. At second level... You get an ability called Sculpt Spells. You can create pockets of relative safety within the effects of your evocation spells. When you cast an evocation spell that affects other creatures that you can see, you can choose a number of them equal to 1 plus the spell's level. The chosen creatures automatically succeed on their saving throws against the spell, and they take no damage if they would normally take half damage on a successful save. Yes. (laughs) Yes. <laughs> this is literally built for fireball. Your barbarian is fighting an enemy and you're afraid that you're gonna kill your barbarian somehow if you yeah. cast a spell on the enemy. No longer. No yeah, more I've fear. Got a, I've got an evocation <laughs> wizard in one of my games and he's just like this is my little pocket dimension. <laughs> yeah. That I put my homies in whenever I cast flaming hands or whatever it is that I'm casting. <laughs> it's pretty great. <laughs> I like hey, it you. a lot. This isn't meant for you. Get out of there. Uh, at 6th level, you get potent cantrip. Your damaging cantrips affect even creatures that avoid the brunt of the effect. When a creature succeeds on a saving throw against your cantrip, the creature takes half the cantrip's damage, if any, but suffers no additional effect. Oh man, do I wish that like clerics could get this? <laughs> <laughs> like literally every damaging cleric cantrip is like saving throw. And I'm like, yeah. oh, man. I just wanna like not have to use a spell slot but also roll 
<laughs> a dice. Yeah. Please, it's my turn. Let me roll a dice. <laughs> no. If you want to roll <laughs> dice, you better start healing, boy. <laughs> Basically, yeah. It's like, oh, man. Anyways. And if you're still feeling like you're not pumping out enough damage, at 10th level you get Empowered Evocation, which allows you to add your Intelligence modifier to one damage roll of any Wizard Evocation spell you cast. Yes. <laughs> nice. Just add more. <laughs> hey, you just uh, you just got that one invocation for warlocks. Just add it on the firebolt or whatever cantrip you use. <laughs> <laughs> just like, hey, I get to add damage, like consistent damage to my spells now. Cool. Yeah, it's pretty great. So the one thing that I cast like all the freaking time. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, 14th level, you get your last ability of an evocation wizard, and that is over channel. You can increase the power of your simpler spells. When you cast a wizard spell of 5th level or lower, uh, not including cantrips, that deals damage, you can deal max damage with that spell. The first time you do so, you suffer no adverse effect. If you use this feature again before you finish a long rest, you take 2d12 necrotic damage for each level of the spell immediately after you cast it. Ooh. Each time you use this feature again before finishing a long rest, the necrotic damage per spell increases by 1d12. The damage ignores resistance and immunity. Ooh. Okay, well, hear me Ouch. out, guys. You know that, like, classic scene where in an anime there's, like, somebody throwing magic and they're, like, their body is literally, like, falling apart. Like, they're hurting themselves to do it, but they're inflicting massive amounts of damage. You can yeah. be that guy now. You'd be like, <laughs> you're, like, he's killing himself. He's like, yeah, but, dude, he's, like, firestorming it up right now. Dude, <laughs> like, do, you, do you know like, how much bigger a D12 is to a D6? <laughs> I, don't on, know if baby. I, could, I don't know if I could be playing around with that kind of business, man. Yo, that's what it's not playing around. It's like this is the end. This is the BBEG. Like, oh, I don't no. know if I could be doing that. I'm stuff, about to. Man. I'm about to wreck this man. Like, that's some <laughs> sketchy area right there. It's like, oh boy. <laughs> but yeah, uh, that's that's pretty much it for evocation, correct, Michael? Yes, that is uh, it. That's all their abilities so let's uh mosey on over to one of my favorite schools of magic uh this one here is called illusion Ooh. <laughs> it's also one of my favorites it's a really good one you stole adoration from me so i got to steal illusion from you <laughs> oh man um illusion magic is stuff that like you know you just like trick people you know it's like you make pictures or sounds or whatever you know you're just doing something with magic to to fool someone else, most likely. But, starting at the second level, you get improved Minor Illusion. Automatically, you get Minor Illusion as a cantrip, and if you picked it already before, at first level, you get to pick a new cantrip right now, and this does not count against cantrips that you currently have. I personally love it when the game is just like, here, have this extra cantrip that is like already fitting for your character, and now you get to pick any other ca cantrip, because you probably already had this cantrip, because it goes in line with your character so well. Like, awesome. Also, I just really like Minor Illusion as a spell. But, you get Minor Illusion for free, and you also, whenever you cast Minor Illusion, you can create both a sound and an image with a single casting of the spell. You know how useful that can be? <laughs> <laughs> you know how many times I've cast Minor Illusion making a sound around the corner? Or <laughs> or just like this silent thing just like sitting there? Like, you know how many times I've had to do it where it's just like trying to like make it, make it seem realistic, but then like, you know, give me enough time to run away? Now, you can just... Put it right in front of them. Hey, this thing is moving, looks like a thing, and it makes sound. How realistic. You know? Anyways. I think my I favorite like thing my to make would probably be like a tiny tap dancing man. Yeah, there's like a little <laughs> toy. Like the monkey doing the symbols. Just like... Psh, 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 psh. <laughs> uh, that would be so funny. Yeah. 
Uh, starting at 6th level, you get an ability called Malleable Illusions. When you cast an illusion spell that has a duration of 1 minute or longer, you can use your action to change the nature of that illusion, using the spell's normal parameters for the illusion, of course, provided that you can see the illusion. So you can just, like, change what it is after you already did it. Pretty useful. So that way, you don't have to, like, cast it again, taking place of your concentration from the one before, you know? So it's just kind of helpful. Uh, starting at 10th level, you get an ability called Illusory Step. Um, you can create an illusory duplicate of yourself at an instant, as an instant, almost instinctual reaction to danger. When a creature makes an attack roll against you, you can use your reaction to intercept, uh, interpose the illusory duplicate between the attacker and yourself. The attack automatically misses you, then the illusion dissipates. Once you use this feature, you can't use it again until you finish a short or long rest. Pretty, uh, pretty useful, I think. That's, that's pretty good, pretty good. Yeah. I don't think it's as good as the 14th level ability, though. Uh, we haven't gotten the there. Level. We haven't gotten no. there, mister. I'm just thinking about it. The next ability you get is called Illusory Reality. By 14th level, you've learned the secret of weaving shadow magic into your illusions to give them a semi-reality. When you cast an illusion spell of first level or higher, you can choose one inanimate, non-magical object that is part of the illusion and make that object real. You can do this on your turn as a bonus action while the spell is ongoing. The object remains real for one minute. The object can't deal damage or otherwise directly harm anyone. So you can't make like a sword and just whack people with it. But this is so useful in like multiple instances. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I like, like to use it with illusory dragon, way. and then make the heat of its fire real. Not the damage, but just the heat. That way, yeah. they think it's like, oh my god, he just saw, he just conjured a dragon. <laughs> what, what happened? <laughs> what just happened? Or just like anything. I mean, like you know, just you can make things like malleable and like touch. I can touch this illusion. It's an illusion, but I can still touch it. This can't be an illusion. Yeah. Exactly. Like Use a minor illusion to make gold pieces appear. True. They look like gold pieces. They feel like gold pieces. You clink them together and they sound like gold pieces. Because you can for do a minute. The... Yep, for a minute. <laughs> you pay and you dip. <laughs> yep, yep. Yep. But anyways. That's, that's when uh... you just flip my platinum pieces to keep the change. That way they don't even have to count out anything. <laughs> yeah. You're just like, keep the change, sugar. Bye. <laughs> okay, bye. Well, you know what's also great? It's not illusion great, but, I mean, it is, like, pretty great. Yeah. You ever wanted to have friends but not have them talk back? <laughs> so let me introduce yeah, I... you to necromancy. Yeah, I hate you guys. You guys are the worst. I wish you guys would just shut up. So necromancy. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> At second level, uh, oh, first of all, necromancy. It's magic that involves raising the dead or controlling the souls or people. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So you, you basically you get an undead army now. That's a thing that you get. I feel like every wizard that I come into contact with as a player may not be a necromancy wizard to start, but towards the end. Or somewhere in the middle, they they dabbled in necromancy at some point, where they were just like, "What if I just raised zombies instead of like doing effort?" I mean, here's <laughs> the thing: it's so effective, though. Yeah. <laughs> at second level, you get Grim Harvest. You gain the ability to reap life energy from creatures you kill with your spells. Once per turn, when you kill one or more creatures with a spell of first level or higher, you regain hit points equal to twice the spell's level or three times if the level of the spell belongs to the school of necromancy. Oh, yeah. You don't gain this benefit for killing constructs or undead. But here's the thing. That works even if you're not using necromancy. So you could just fireball an entire room of people and just be like, I feel bad. I feel great. This is awesome. I feel lovely right now. At level 6, you get Undead Thralls. At level 6, you add the Animate Dead spell to your spellbook, if it's not there already, which means you get a free extra spell. 
When you cast Animate Dead, you can target one additional corpse or pile of bones, creating another zombie or skeleton as appropriate. Whenever you create an undead using a necromancy spell, it has additional benefits. The creature's hit points maximum is increased by an amount equal to your wizard level. Beefier boys, more health between you and the enemy. First of all, that's amazing. Let's do the it. creature adds your proficiency bonus to its weapon damage rolls. Oh. More damage. So if they attack your wall of boys, the wall of boys hits harder. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and there's one more of them than there should yes. be. Yes. Yes. Dude, I, I loved playing Drogo in Curse of Strahd, because I was like, Strahd threw all his minions at me, and I was like, oh yeah? Well, touche, buddy. I have just as many minions as you. <laughs> My party more. members died? Well, guess what? I just have a really fancy skeleton or zombie note. <laughs> I've got a zombie with, with magical stuff. Magical yeah. items. <laughs> that I can't even use, so I don't even care to take back. <laughs> like, <laughs> I do not care. <laughs> this zombie has... What's this? Oh, boots of flying. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Nuts. At level cool. 10, you get inured to undeath. Beginning at 10th level, you have resistance to necrotic damage, and your hit point maximum can't be reduced. So vampires... Not a problem. That's why I love playing in Curse of Strahd. Screw you! <laughs> you have spent so much time dealing with undead and the for and the forces that animate them that you've become inured to some of their worst effects. Nice. There you go. And at level 14, you get Command Undead. Starting at 14th level, you can use magic to bring undead under your control, even those created by other wizards. As an action, you can choose one undead you can see within 60 feet of you. That creature must make a charisma saving throw against your wizard spell save DC. If it succeeds, you can't use this feature on it again. If it fails, it becomes friendly to you and obeys your commands until you use this feature again. Intelligent undead are harder to control in this way. If the target has an intelligence of 8 or higher, it has advantage on the saving throw. If it fails the saving throw and has an intelligence of 12 or higher, it can repeat the saving throw at end of every hour until it succeeds and breaks free. Nice. Fun fact. That ability, canonically in my world, is how Drogo managed to escape Strahd. <laughs> he convinced him to let him leave. Yep. <laughs> Strahd did it. He just like, he was like, Strahd, let me leave. Have the mist take me back home. And he did it. Because he followed his orders. GG's. He never forgave him for that. But that is the school of necromancy. Necromancy, by the way, is so good if you manage your spells properly. Will you ever mm -hmm. deal damage that's not from a cantrip? No. Will you have a million zombies? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Do you care? No. <laughs> <laughs> I had so many undead, I literally stormed Strahd's castle and was just like, this seems like it's working. <laughs> <laughs> I have so many boys. They like forming ladders of undeath and like climbing each other to get up the walls. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Literally did not. Necromancy that. is pretty top notch. But I, I personally am a fan of transmutation. Transmutation Ooh, like our good magic. good boy Lava. Yeah, our good boy Lava. Transmutation wizards, uh, or magic in general, is kind of like changing one thing into another thing. So, like, um,. Some spell examples could be like uh, enlarge reduce. You are changing something of this size to be big size <laughs> or small size, you know, that kind of thing. Um, but mostly it's just like modifying matter per se. But starting at second level, you get an ability called Minor Alchemy. Um, when you select the school, you can temporarily alter the physical properties of one non-magical object, changing it from one substance into another. You perform a special alchemical procedure on one object composed entirely of wood, stone, but not gemstone, iron, copper, or silver, transforming it into a different one of those materials. For each 10 minutes you spend performing the procedure, you can transform up to one cubic foot of material. After one hour, or until you lose your concentration, as if you were concentrating on a spell, the material reverts to its original substance. If you guys didn't catch that, two of those were copper 
and silver, which, if you didn't know, Money. are currencies. <laughs> You can literally just make your copper into silver. For an hour. You can make wood <laughs> into, into silver. silver. Exactly. Exactly my point. But yeah. For an hour, but still. Which I'm shocked Lava Lamp never did. Yeah. He doesn't really have too much need for money, to be honest. Yeah, but That's like scary. as questionable as his ethics were, he never once was like, man... I'm gonna cheat the system and I think, rob someone I think, of the money. I like to think it's because Cade was in his party and he was just like, that's bad. <laughs> he was no like, cool. Oh, okay. Dalton, we know you're gonna listen to this, so tell us why once you hear this. <laughs> <laughs> I can already see the Snapchat going to all of us <laughs> yeah. right now of him like driving home. Uh, and now it's gonna be him laughing at this exact statement that I'm yep. saying right now. Anyways. Uh, starting at 6th level, you get an ability called Transmuter Stone. Uh, you can sp spend 8 hours creating a Transmuter Stone that stores transmutation magic. You can benefit from the stone yourself or give it to another creature. The creature gains the benefit of your choice as long as the stone is in the creature's possession. When you create the stone, choose the, be uh, the benefits from the following options. Um, you can either have Dark Vision out to a range of 60 feet. Um, you can have an increased spe speed by 10 feet. Um, while the creature is unencumbered, so they can't, like, have a bunch of crap on them. But also, a lot of people don't care too much about weight in D&D. But anyways, you can also have proficiency in constitution saving throws. So you can maybe sh keep concentrating on all those darn spells. Or you can have resistance to acid, cold, fire, lightning, or thunder damage. Of your choice, whatever you um, each, time you, each time you cast a transmutation spell of first level or higher, you can change the effect on your stone if the stone is on your person. If you create a new transmuter stone, the previous one ceases to function. So you can't just make a bunch of transmutation stones and just like deal them out to people and just be like, here you go, man. Here, you want some dark vision? Have this. Have this little rock on your person and you'll, you can see in the dark. Hey, you also want to resist fire damage? Here, have this rock. I've got a lightning one too if you want. <laughs> <laughs> you can't just like deal out stones just, just to everybody <laughs> that you meet for the small price of your time. But... Next up, you get an ability called Shape Changer. At 10th level, you add the Polymorph spell to your spellbook, if it is not already there. You can cast Polymorph without expending a spell slot. When you do so, you can target only yourself and transform into a beast whose challenge rating is 1 or lower. Once you cast Polymorph in this way, you can't do so again until you finish a short or long rest, though you can still cast it normally using an available spell slot. Pretty neat. You get one free polymorph every day. Uh, CR one or lower. But a one free polymorph nonetheless. That became like one of Lava's go-to. <laughs> yeah. It's just like, hey, what if like I was something else? <laughs> or like, hey, what if that enemy was just like a, a duck? duck? A duck. <laughs> it was always a duck. <laughs> And then it was always immediately just like into the bag of holding. <laughs> you just you just hear Dalton talking at the table while we're like discussing what to do with an enemy that we're about to be fighting, and he just walks in there and he's just duck. <laughs> <laughs> and then we throw him in the bag of holding and suffocates. Yeah. Or in the one case of that one guy, he escaped because Dalton stopped concentrating and he was like, "Well, time to teleport." Yeah. Yep. <laughs> And then you guys looked back, and I was like, the duck's gone. They were like, wait, what? The duck's gone? I was like, is there a body? I was like, no. <laughs> <laughs> hmm. Strokes facial hair. <laughs> uh, next up, your next ability is Master Transmuter. Starting at 14th level, you can use your action to consume the reserve of transmutation magic stored within your transmuter stone in a single burst. When you do so, choose one of your one of the following effects. Your transmuter stone is destroyed and can't be remade until you finish a long rest. One, major transformation. You can transmute one non-magical object, no longer than a five-foot cube, into another non-magical object of similar size and mass and of equal or lesser value. You must spend ten minutes handling the object to transform it. Pretty neat. 
Uh, two, you can remove all curses, diseases, and poisons affecting a creature that you touch with the transmuter stone. The creature also regains all of its hit points. <laughs> mm-hmm. Nice. Three, you can cast the Raise Dead spell on a creature you touch with the transmuter stone without expending a spell slot or needing to have the spell in your spell book. Raise Dead. That <laughs> brings characters back after they died. And that's the fifth level option. Not Revivify, which is third level, which is like, oh shoot, panic, do it in a minute or else they die forever. No. This one you have like a couple hours, I think, maybe? I don't know. I can't ten remember. days. Ten days. You have ten days. <laughs> oh no, you're out. Your poor shiny rock is gone for one day. But you get your paladin back. <laughs> or whoever the frick died, you know? Anyways. Also, uh, last option here for Restore Youth. You can touch the transmuter stone to a willing creature, and that creature's apparent age is reduced by 3d10 years to a minimum of 13 years. This effect doesn't extend the creature's lifespan. Fun fact, Lava Lamp did this to my character without my character knowing what the heck was going on. And he was kind of <laughs> upset about it afterwards. <laughs> yeah, Lava Lamp literally walked up to my character and he was like, Hey, Cade, you want to see a magic trick? And I was like, not really, but I guess. <laughs> and he was like, touch this rock. And I was like, okay. And he was like, are you willing? And I was like, I mean, technically. And he was like... You're this much younger now. And I was like, what? <laughs> he was like, but not really. And I was like, what the heck, man? Like, what? You just okay. appear to be younger. <laughs> I kind of liked the idea of my character just being this grumpy old man, but now he doesn't look so grumpy and old anymore. He looks a lot younger than any of you have ever seen him before. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah. I made it canon because he used to have, like, a really, like, long beard, but now, <laughs> now it's, like, sh like scruffy because because he was only like 40 years old so we reduced him to like his 20s so he's just like he looks like hecka young now yeah uh, i was like okay i guess and he was like uh, uh and i was like all right thanks i guess anyways that's uh that's it for transmutation wizards pretty cool i'm not gonna lie all around yeah, Transmutation Wizards do have some really nice abilities. Really cool things, really cool things. Ray's dead for free is pretty crazy, honestly. Yeah. <laughs> it doesn't say it covers the cost, but it's still for free and you're not a cleric, so... <laughs> oh, great. <laughs> Add paladin. another thing to pay for as the wizard. Yeah. And your whole but hey, party gets themselves killed, now you hey, have to pay for it. Hey, they get brought back from the dead. Why are you complaining? <laughs> Just pay for it with money that you have transmuted. <laughs> I don't think it tricks the gods, uh, man. I, I don't think it really works <laughs> like that. <money>. Listen. <laughs> All right. Uh, our last subclass that we are going to be covering today. Uh, this this is the only subclass that we're covering today that is from Xanathar's. Everything else is from the PHB. Yep. And this is also the one that is not dedicated to a single school of magic. This is called... I don't know you, but okay. I mean, out of the ones we're reviewing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. This one is called War Magic. And what this is, is a blending of the principles of evocation and abjuration. So, it's teaching you techniques that empower a caster's spells while also allowing you to kind of increase your own defense system so that way you're not quite as squishy and, you know, gonna die. <laughs> so, it's also the only one, besides maybe blade singing, that you don't get the whole, uh, your, your spell book gets have cost and time for certain spell types being copied into it. That's not a thing for this caster. So, you get Arcane Deflection at second level. So you have learned to weave your magic to fortify yourself against harm. When you're hit by an attack or you fail a saving throw, you can use your reaction to gain a plus two bonus to your AC against that attack or a plus four bonus to that saving throw. When you use this feature, you cannot cast spells other than cantrips until the end of your next turn. 
Yeah, you'll lose the ability to cast some powerful spells, maybe, but you also uh, don't take a huge hit, maybe. So, True. <laughs> pretty yeah. good. Also, at second level, you get Tactical Wit. Your keen ability to assess tactical situations allows you to act quickly in battle. You can give yourself a bonus to your initiative rolls equal to your intelligence modifier. It's always nice to be able to kind of go first. <laughs> or at least before the enemies. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But, you know, we, we've done the whole discussion of when's a good time to go in combat as far as initiative. Yeah. Sometimes it's not. Sometimes it is. Depends on how you feel and how you play your character, you know? Yeah. The, the nice thing, though, is that, like, it doesn't get the the Savant thing where, like, things cost less. Certain spells cost less. But it does get one normal ability, like everyone else gets, where it's, like, a thing that, you know, like a normal ability. In mm -hmm. And one, like, passive thing that just is, like, a thing. So, like, you get, you get your intelligence to your attack, or, or you get your intelligence to your initiative, which is, like, the passive thing. And you get the thing where, like... You know, you probably don't get hit, but hey, just Firebolt next turn instead of casting a spell. <laughs> well, and so, here's the thing that I really like with the way that Tactical Wit is worded. If you don't want to go early in combat, you could not give yourself the Intelligence Modifier boost to your initiative. Because it says yeah. you can you give can. yourself a bonus. You don't yeah. have to. Yeah. Which I think is great. Yeah. At 6th level, you get Power Surge. You can store magical energy within yourself to later empower your damaging spells. In its stored form, this energy is called a Power Surge. You can store a maximum number of Power Surges equal to your Intelligence modifier, minimum 1. Whenever you finish a long rest, your number of Power Surges resets to 1. Whenever you successfully end a spell with Dispel Magic or Counterspell, you gain 1 Power Surge. As you steal magic from the spell you foiled. If you end a short rest with no power surges, you gain one power surge. Once per turn when you deal damage to a creature or object with a wizard spell, you can spend one power surge to deal extra force damage to that target. The extra damage equals half your wizard level. So you're automatically, when you get this ability, able to deal just an extra three damage of force damage. That's fun. Did you just tell me that I can get more out of the spell counterspell? Yes. Sign me up. <laughs> <laughs> I'm down. Let's do it. <laughs> yeah. Counterspell has more than one great effect. <laughs> Sounds great. And once I'm you hit 40. 20th level, you're just dealing an extra 10 damage. Per spell. Yeah. yeah. As long as you use your power surge. <laughs> yeah. And you keep counterspelling things. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> At 10th level, you get durable magic. The magic you channel helps ward off harm. While you maintain concentration on a spell, you have a plus two bonus to AC and all saving throws. So you're more likely to be able to keep your concentration. That's yeah. fun. <laughs> plus two to AC, so you're least likely to, less likely to get hit and less likely to take damage, therefore less likely to need to make a saving throw. To mm -hmm. keep your concentration. And also, if that does happen, then you are less likely to fail the said saving throw because you get more of a bonus. Yeah. I'm all in for it, yeah. It's pretty this, great. This subclass so far has just been screaming frontline, frontline, frontline. <laughs> You're essentially a frontline wizard. Yeah. I'll it's fantastic. At 14th level, you get Deflecting Shroud. Your arcane deflection becomes infused with deadly magic. When you use your arcane deflection feature, you can cause magical energy to arc from you. Up to three creatures of your choice that you can see within 60 feet of you each take force damage equal to half your wizard level. So yeah, that's fun. You ever just explode? <laughs> Sometimes. Not so, as much as wild magic sorcerer, but you know. 
<laughs> so, I Not mean, as as that guy at, at 20th level, between Deflecting Shroud and Power Surge, uh, you're able to deal an extra 20 damage just for free, basically. Yeah. <laughs> per turn. Well, I love yeah. it. <laughs> War magic is fun. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, yeah, that's that's it for war magic, man. Another thing to be said, though, um, there are three other, well, more now, but because we've only been bringing up things before Tasha's came out in this, like, kind of series that we've been doing, there are three other wizard subclasses. One is from Sword Coast Adventures Guide, and that is the Blade Singing. Um, subclass, and also two came out with Explorer's Guide to Wildemount, which is Chronoturgy and Graviturgy. And if you want to see each of those, you can look back at some of the um, one shots of this podcast in the one shot that Michael ran. I believe it is episode seven or session seven. Um, I played a Graviturgy wizard, and I believe in session nine and ten, um, Michael played a Chronoturgy wizard. Thank you, Matt Mercer. <laughs> yeah, really cool, really cool. I totally recommend you guys go check those out. Really cool spells, very powerful, awesome Yeah, also, also just check out Explorer's Guide to Wildemount anyways, because you can get Dunamancy spells, which is what those spells are, the uh, gravity and time spells. <laughs> and, I mean, you you can have any wizard have access to them, or you can even make them something that is like on a scroll or in a spell book that you can yeah. stumble across in an adventure. Like technically in the book, how it's written, only those spells are only supposed to be available to Graviturgy and Chronoturgy wizards in general. Like no one else can learn them unless they have a Chronoturgy or Graviturgy wizard teach them to them. But I mean, if you're the DM, you can say whatever the heck you want, and you can just say like anybody can take these spells because they're freaking awesome. <laughs> also, beware because they can do some pretty broken things. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, those spells, those uh, subclasses exist, and you should go check them out if you sound interested. Indeed. Now, yes. guys, I have something very important to ask you guys. Yes. What's up? When it comes to playing a wizard, how do you guys like to roleplay your wizard? What flavor of wizard do you like? Yeah, so for me, wizards are generally, even though they're more intelligent than wise, generally, um, I, I like to think of my wizards as the wise old man or woman that is also a little bit of a mad scientist. Yeah. Got got some crazy hair going on whenever you see them. And, you know, they're always looking crazy. Because you never know what they're doing. And neither do they. Because they're always experimenting with new spells. Yeah. Uh, I mean, uh, for me, a lot of my characters can tend to have, like, high wisdom, low intelligence. Kind of like that kind of deal. But I think it's a lot more... I th I've recently started discovering that I also think it's really cool to have high intelligence, low wisdom. Uh, kind of the lava lamp perspective, per se, where, like, you, you're you smart, you know things, you just use them in the wrong way sometimes because you just don't really, like, have experience or whatever, you know. But um, I could also say that that is also fun to play like a bad scientist kind of thing but also i typically say like you could range from a everyday book nerd just like this like hipster guy or whatever i guess or you could be some old decrepit dude <laughs> who's like wrinkly and whatnot <laughs> he's also a nerd nevertheless you're an intelligence-based caster so you're probably some sort of nerd but that's not necessarily a bad thing so personally i take the the road of no matter what kind of wizard you are no matter where you got your abilities from you've spent a significant amount of time studying magic and how it works understanding it to the point yeah. where you can copy things from that other people have made and understand them and recreate them so i think that every wizard should talk to their dm and say, how does magic work in your world? That way you can have an understanding of it. And even if your character has a different understanding of it that's not entirely correct, you know what is wrong so that you can play it even better. 
Because then you yeah. might discover you're wrong along the way of the story. It's just like, man, my entire understanding of this thing I've been studying for years is wrong. And then how do you cope yeah. with that? Do you accept it or do you fight it? Do you like, no, I'm not wrong. I know I'm not wrong. The world is wrong. I'm not wrong. I feel yeah. like every wizard should have proficiency in Arcana. Like, That's a, yeah. Agreed. Like, it doesn't really make too much sense to me if they weren't. Like, how? How do you get where you're at right now and not understand magic? <laughs> By being so a mad than, like, scientist. More so than, like, a normal person. Yeah. Unless you just literally memorize every spell you've ever had and you're just like, I don't know exactly how it works, but I know how to cast it. You're just like, a mad I scientist. I do the little wavy, wavy thing with my hands, and then poof, something happens. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you were really secretly know. a sorcerer all along. Yeah, I was going to say, it kind of sounds like a sorcerer to me, but okay, okay. Wait, did did you guys hear that? Oh. Huh? Oh, do you mean... <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> Hello, and welcome. To the Ben's low-level magic item corner today, we're discussing some items for wizards. Yes. Hello. Stay a while and listen. Maybe. <laughs> what have you got? <laughs> Catch today, my interest. <laughs> for you low-level wizards who might not have such a high intelligence at the beginning of the game, I've got for say? you the headband of intellect. Oh, okay, okay. Which okay. makes your intelligence 19, if it isn't already higher. And yeah. even then, once you acquire that high intelligence you seek as you level up, you can always give the headband to a neighborhood dog and make them <laughs> your new companion. Mm. <laughs> Maybe teach them a few spells. Okay, okay, okay. The yeah, unforbidding. <laughs> The next item I have is actually wielded by one of the wizards that plays in my games. It's yes. called the Ring of Mind Shielding. It prevents anyone from detecting your thoughts, reading your mind, or determining if you are telling truth or lies to them. Which for a wizard who contains many arcane secrets within their noggin, that's a good one. <laughs> Additionally, if you should die, if the worst should happen, your soul will remain trapped inside the ring, and anyone who puts it on, you can communicate with them telepathically. Therefore, you're not really gone. Your knowledge will never be lost, because indeed, whoever, <laughs> whatever sad loser decides to put on that ring, you yes, can just annoy yes. them all the time about your magical findings, your arcane findings. But at the same time, you must remember, if the party is going to revive you, that means your soul is in a safe place until they manage to do so. That's true, that's true. And if they don't manage to do it right away, you can still offer them your advice and knowledge. That is also true. Without worrying of dying. Now, if now if my party member died and they went sucked up into that ring and then I put on that ring so that way I can hear them and then I died, what happened? Uh, unfortunately, only one soul can be inside the ring at a time. So do I tell him to move out? <laughs> uh, unfortunately, you would just die. You, you, you're dead. Oh, okay. That's fine. You just go to the afterlife, which for the wizard that wields that, where, that ring, that is not what he wants. Yeah. Because he's going to hell. <laughs> <laughs> like straight down there was not even a moment where he started going up he just like elevator <laughs> elevator dropped his way down <laughs> no he's, he's, he's not enough of a luxury to get an elevator you're right he just <laughs> all, he just opens up plummets down no hesitation anyways the third item I have can yeah. function as your spell casting focus but also grants you some additional benefits. The Wand of Secrets. Perfect for those wizards who wish to hide what knowledge they have and gain more. If you use one of the charges on this wand, you can detect if there are any magical doors, hidden doors, trap doors, anything of that sort hidden within 30 feet of you. Perfect for discovering even more arcane secrets. Scrolls, true, spell books, true. things of the like. 
Next yeah. week, the, the regular guy will be back, by the way. I'm just taking care of the shop while he's gone. Oh, okay. Well, I'm a rogue, so... Oh, uh, understandable. Really... Here's our cash register. <laughs> oh, okay, thanks, thanks. <laughs> I'm just gonna... I'm just gonna... I'm gonna... I'm gonna leave now, okay? Okay, okay bye, old weird guy who took over Ben's thing. Okay, bye. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was a productive, <laughs> a productive time. Uh, now we know all about wizards. Yeah. And let's be real, guys. The, the most unique thing you can do with a wizard is choose the spells that no one else is going to and make them good. One of the best ways to do that, I think, I accomplished by playing my favorite wizard I've ever played. His name is Berend Ingat. Yeah. He is a dwarf. He's a dwarf wizard. Uh, specifically, he's an abjuration wizard. I have to start, though, before he became a wizard. Before he became a wizard, Berend Ingat is from a huge, huge family of dwarves. He has over a hundred cousins. First cousins. Weak. Weak. He's got even more extended family. He is one of 32 siblings. Weak. <laughs> and all of his siblings and all of his extended family are all competing to be the leader of Clan Ungart, which his father currently is. Only the most powerful one and that doesn't mean physical power, that could mean influence, that could mean political power, anything of that nature. Only the most powerful can be selected to be the leader of Clan Ungart. And that is what Berend wants, more than anything in the world. So he made a dark deal. A dark pact, one might say. He worships a god associated with, not the dwarves per se, but the Dwergar. Mm. The most hated and vile enemies of the dwarves. The, the dwarves that abandoned their creator god. Specifically, he worships a god of secrecy. And this uh, this god that he worships, whose name is Ladaguer, taught him the best way to achieve power is through deception, lies, and secrets. And that is exactly what he did. He became an architect. He designs castles and fortresses for mighty kings and emperors and armies. And one of the things he claims, and he is very famous for, is that his castles are nigh impenetrable. And it's mostly true. However, there is one problem that he keeps running into. Wizards would just teleport into his castles. <laughs> they would teleport and bring all their soldiers with them and he hated it it was the one thing that was keeping his castles from being completely impenetrable so he started to work a or focusing his magic and uh, focusing his studies on abjuration in order to prevent this from happening and in the process discovered a new use for his magic one that his god was very happy to encourage him to do he started building magical, arcane back doors into his own castles. Ones that only he knew about, and ones that you had to have a specific code given by him in order to access, and he would not tell anyone about them. Until one day, a castle that was completely impenetrable to all manners of magic and wizards was being attacked, and the ones attacking it wanted to know its weaknesses. So they tracked down Benin, and were going to interrogate him and beat him to uh, a bloody pulp in order to get him to tell what is the weakness of your castle. How do we get inside? But they were surprised when he said, I'll sell you the answer. Not only will I sell you the answer, I'll show you how to get your entire army inside the castle without them having any, any idea how you did it. And so he did. They paid him a huge sum. He made a huge amount of money. And they used his back door to sneak right in. And then, right as they claimed victory, Berend remotely triggered the bomb he left underneath the castle, destroying it completely. 
leaving no trace that his castle had ever been breached. And he does this repeatedly across his entire life. He just keeps doing this over and over and over again to the point where now his castles are so famous, everyone wants one. Mm -hmm. Because they're like, the only way to destroy his castles are to blow them off the face of the planet. They are the most dependable fortresses ever built. <laughs> and using this method, Berend is slowly but surely gaining power and influence over his entire clan. <laughs> that is Berend Ungar. Another weird thing about Berend Ungard, because he's a dwarf, he's automatically proficient in medium armor. Yeah. And with battle axes. So yeah. Berend, being the abjuration boy he was, he would wield a battle axe, and he would carry his spellbook in the other hand, and his battle axe, and he would wear, like, chain armor, I think it was, and he would walk into the front lines with the barbarian all the time. And he would use his abjuration spells to keep himself from get taking damage so that he would always have temporary hit points. <laughs> <laughs> and he was a frontline wizard, and his favorite spell was grease. He would grease the floor and make enemies fall over, and then him and the barbarian would walk up and just whack them, just kill them on the spot. <laughs> <laughs> or I would use grease, and then another... I think our sorcerer would use firebolt, and then our cleric would use create water and make it just <laughs> explode. <laughs> that was when we created that. And then our cleric stopped coming, so we were like, oh man, get a bucket of water and have the barbarian carry it. And we did the same thing. <laughs> we did not care. And then our cleric came back, but our wizard stopped going, so the barbarian was just like, I guess I'll have a torch now. And I'm like, yeah. And then he would just light the creek. <laughs> Anyways, mm. that's enough about Berend Ungart. He's a compli complex character that I love playing, but I think it's time to close up our session for the week. Yep. Another thing I like about Baron though is that like he's just I just wasn't in that game, so I just like hearing stories about him because I didn't know them before and I wasn't there for it. So it's like, oh nice. That's fun. Anyways, if uh, the listeners didn't know before now you can uh, find our podcasts on youtube um, at the same time same exact time that these go up on any other platform um, you can also find them on youtube so you can check them out at travelers tips and tales you can also um, go check out our instagram on any updates about what we're doing or anything like that or also see some spicy memes that i i make for you guys every now and then you can go check out our instagram at travelers tips and tales we also technically have a facebook twitter and tumblr page that exist hey I, I updated i updated facebook and twitter today at time of recording uh okay, twitter okay. is also not traveler tips and tales it's at tips yeah, tales. well i was getting there, I was getting there. <laughs> at traveler's tips and tales at tips tales and traveler's tips and tales respectively for facebook tumblr or no facebook then twitter then tumblr <laughs> we also have a patreon page <laughs> With a couple of spicy patrons that we really appreciate on, uh, and that is called Traveler's Tips and Tales. If you'd like to go and support us on Patreon, we'd also like to thank Ben's mom for being one of our patrons. Very cool. Thank you, Ben's Much mom. Appreciated. Um, also, we also have an email if you'd like to ask us any questions about anything really. We don't really care. <laughs> uh, you can email us at Traveler's Tips and Tales at gmail.com or you can go check out our website and you can see some spicy homebrew stuff or just more stuff about us or whatever on our website we have at Traveler's Tips and Tales dot com. Yeah. Also on YouTube we are now posting other content other than just podcasts so check it yeah. out. Come check us out. And as always Adventure awaits. Adventure awaits.